Hola, bienvenidos. Good afternoon. My name is Abelardo de la Peña, Jr., the Director of Marketing and Communications here at La Plaza de Cultura, Cultura y Artes, welcoming you to today's En Casa con la Plaza Cocina. Thanks for joining us. En Casa con la Plaza Cocina, we've been doing it on Mondays, our cooking demonstrations from the best chefs, restaurateurs, and bakers in the whole world of Mexican cooking. If you've joined us on Zoom, welcome, bienvenidos. Let us know where you're viewing from. If you have any questions, you could use the chat feature or the Q&A and we'll get you there. Facebook friends, thank you for joining us as well. You could uh, chime in on our, in the comment section there of uh, Facebook, ask questions, make comments, lo que sea. We appreciate it. Thanks to our sponsors, Union Pacific Foundation, Institute of Museum and Library Services. Catch you up what's going on at La Plaza. We're open now. We changed our hours starting this week. So we're closed on Mondays and Tuesdays. We open from Wednesdays to Fridays, I mean, Wednesdays through Saturday, through Sundays from 12 to five, uh, shorten our hours on weekends uh, and then also closed on those two days to give our staff a chance to catch up, to plan for the exhibitions and for all the programming that you enjoy, including En Casa Con La Plaza. All of our exhibitions are open. Uh, and also La Cocina is open. Our inaugural exhibition, Maiz, Past, Present and Future, closes in a few, in a few weeks. So you, you have to come and check it out along with our wonderful exhibits here at La Plaza. Uh, we just had our Dia de los Niños family day. You can enjoy some of the moments on our Facebook page and Instagram feed, the clips of the danzantes, plus photos of the incredible crowd that came down. Next week on Sunday, Cinco de Mayo Family Day. Uh, enjoy a, a theatrical presentation by written by David, Dr. David Hayes Bautista and much more that day. It's 12 to four, free of charge, bring the family please. And with that, I present to you our host of En Casa Con La Plaza Cocina, Jimena Mart. Please join us. Hey, how are you? Good, good. Okay. You. Um, okay. Today we have on my favorite bakers from Mexico City, Mr. Eliseo Lara. He's been with us quite a bit of times and every time he comes, he always brings me his favorite cookie. He says, I'm like, which is your favorite cookie? They're all favorites, but this is a special cookie because this cookie is a street cookie, um, gaznates. And they're a very popular dessert in Mexico City that actually originated in New Spain with the with the, with the, with the convents and the, and, the, um, and the nuns. So this is a type of cookie that most people find out in the streets. However, um, with uh, Eliseo, he's gonna show us how to do this delicious um, convent style treat at home. Eliseo, como estas? Muy bien, Jimena. Thank you very much. And you? I'm good. I'm good, good, good. I think we need to switch the cameras because right now we're just looking at all your spices and stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, there we, so we go. can see you. Um, I'll, I'll fix it on my end. Give me a minute, please. Oh, there you go. Gracias, Abelardo. Okay. A ver, ¿cómo se hace esto? <laughs> okay, there you go. You're done. Okay, bye bye. <laughs> Gracias. So, anyways, um, so I understand it's a really kind of um, crunchy cookie. Can you tell us a little bit more uh, for folks who are not familiar with the gaznatis? Yeah, it's not uh, very popular in the U.S., but it's very, very popular in Mexico. Um, usually, there's these guys who sell meringues in the streets, and they have these um, like round-shaped meringues. Uh, baked meringues, and then this other type of meringue that is called um, gaznates. Think of it as a Mexican cousin of uh, cannolis, of Italian cannolis. So um, in this case, we have a shell also that is uh, deep fried. And then we fill it instead of the mascarpone filling that cannolis have. In this case, we make a um, meringue. Um, this dessert originated in the New Spain, as you were saying. Um, the New Spain was a like, very large territory back in the colonial days of um, Mexico um, that um, was all like Southwest United States, everything that is now Mexico, and all the way down even up to Panama. Uh, depending on who is the researcher, some people even include the Philippines, which was a colony of Spain at the time as well. 
And um, there were a lot of uh, religious orders. And um, in these religious orders, there were a lot of nuns that they would make desserts um, to sell in the streets. And even up to this day, you can find a lot of nuns all throughout the Mexican cities selling, uh, especially now, I think they specialize in cookies, just like cookies in general. Um, but in this case, uh, today we're going to make uh, these delicious gaznates that come from that area. Okay, well, show us how you make it. I'm looking forward to seeing this type of cookie, since this is one of your favorite okay. cookies, one of many favorite yes. cookies. Yeah, <laughs> at least of the street food kind of thing, it's my favorite, definitely. So we're gonna start by making the um, dough. I'm gonna give you the list of ingredients. We're gonna make the dough for the shell. Uh, we're gonna start with some all-purpose flour. That's 190 grams or one and a half cups of all-purpose flour. Uh, we're also gonna use a large pinch of salt. Then we're gonna use a little bit of sugar that is 24 grams or one and a half tablespoons of sugar. Then we're also going to use a little bit of butter. Uh, that's uh, 45 grams or three tablespoons of butter. And we're gonna use also a little bit of white wine. That's going to be 90 grams or a third of a cup of white wine. Um, if you don't have white wine, you can also use apple cider. Um, some people here in Mexico use pulque instead. I'm not sure how popular is pulque in the US, but you can definitely use that if you have that. So let's get started. It's a quite a simple process to make this dough. I'm gonna start with the flour. I'm gonna simply just put everything in a bowl and start mixing. Large pinch of salt, sugar, a little bit of um, butter. Butter is room temperature, preferably. And now my white wine. There you go. I'm gonna start mixing. I'm gonna use a bowl scraper. You can also use a wooden spatula if that's what you have. And this is just to bring everything together. And as soon as this is properly a dough, I'm gonna take this to the counter. And I'm going to start heating my hand. There we go, almost there. I'll take this. Okay. So this is almost completely incorporated. I'm gonna start using my hands. You should have a dough after kneading for let's say one minute in the bowl. Should have a dough that is just a slightly sticky not like super, super sticky, just a slightly sticky and definitely not dry. If it's too dry or too wet, you can adjust with a little extra flour or a little extra wine. There we go. So let me show you how it looks. It's just a slightly sticky and that's it. And I'm gonna start kneading on the counter. I'm simply going to be using my non-dominant hand to fold it, and then my dominant hand to go like this with this part. Fold it and knead. Now, uh, whenever you find a recipe that calls, you, calls for you to knead the dough, it's because you need to develop the gluten. Um, so what is happening inside the dough right now is that there are two proteins. And when you add a liquid and then start kneading, these two proteins bond and they create a new protein called gluten. Famous, super famous gluten. Gluten is what makes the dough elastic. 
So let's say if I take, let me show you because this is important. So you know later when this is ready. If I'm, this is called the window paint test. You might have heard about it if, if you've watched like any of those famous baking shows. Like let's say if I try to create a very thin layer out of it, it just tears. If you need for let's say 10 to 15 minutes, you will be able to create a super thin layer, like a very thin membrane, even light can go through and it will not tear. I'm gonna show you in a moment how that looks because I have a dough ready for us so we can continue the process. And yeah, it takes about, let's say 10 to 15 minutes. You will know this is ready because the dough will surpass the window pane test, but also because the surface will look smoother. Right now it's kind of like rough, doesn't like to, doesn't look too smooth. But later when this is ready, it will look very, very, very different. I have needed this for 10 to 15 minutes. When that happens, your dough is going to look like this. Let me show you. Can you see like the difference in texture? Silky. Quite quick. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Silky smooth. And I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna put this to rest and I will finish kneading it later. And I'm gonna show you how the window paint test looks with this um, dough that I needed previously. So with this one, I can create a very, very thin layer. And as you can see, it's not tearing like it was happening to me before. And that just happens about 30 minutes rest. So you know the gluten structure is not tense anymore and then you can um, roll it. So once you have kneaded and your dough has rested for at least 30 minutes, then we are going to start rolling it. I'm gonna use just a little bit of all-purpose flour. By the way, if anyone needs the um, list of ingredients, I can send it. I think I already, I already sent it to you, but anyone can just uh, get in touch with me and I will email it for them, of course. Do we have um, any questions? Today's, no, no, no. today's a little quiet, so it's kind of nice to hear you explain beautifully how to handcraft this cookie for us. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna start rolling. This needs to be super, super thin. And I am going to be using later these cannoli molds. Um, you can use this if you, you have it. If you don't have this, uh, what a lot of people do is this um, actually what is that they just did some one out, let's say I just but it's what they usually use that in aluminum foil if you don't want it um, to absorb a lot of that oil. Que pena, Liceo, it's, um, we're frozen. 
Maybe it's I'm really frozen. Thin. Yeah, I don't know if uh, you were frozen or I was frozen. So we totally what? missed. I mean, for me, I couldn't hear like the alternative to the cone, you know, for the cannoli. Oh, okay. Okay, perfect. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. So if you don't have these um, cannoli molds, what a lot of people do here is that they just take the stick of a broom, a new one, and they just cut like six inches chunks out of them. Um, if you don't want them to absorb a lot of oil, you can just wrap them in aluminum foil and that's perfect to use it. And you can find that at any, you know, like Home Depot or that kind of store. So for this one, we want to roll it super, super thin almost, um, you want to almost be able to see through. And this side you're gonna come, it's going to depend on the size of the, um, Eliseo, when it comes to the flavoring of the meringue, is it just plain meringue or do folks flavor it with chocolate or cinnamon or vanilla? Best. Mm. Yeah, well, I think our connections today is a little, a little. Um, our internet's not working with us today. Um, so what I asked was, um, with the meringue mixture, is there a flavor that you add to it, or is it always just just uh, plain meringue, just with sugar, and that's it? Um, what they usually use here is that they just use some um, lime zest, and, and that's it. Um, I like, of course, some a little extra. I like to add, let's say, some type of berries. Um, I like to, let's say, today I have some raspberries to mix with the um, uh, with the meringue. That's not that's not, not something that's like very traditional, and that's just like a little extra step that I like. So, real quick, Rosie, what was what I was asking was addition inspired by the cannoli. What's, what's that, sorry? Uh, Rosibel Guzman is asking if the dish was inspired by the cannoli. Oh, I see. Um, uh, because I don't know. This one or the cannoli, one thing that is Que pena, Liceo, but the sound, we're, um, we're freezing. Um, can you can you hear me there? I can hear you now, but like when I was asking you questions, it was just, I don't know if you could hear me, but it was just, it started cutting out. I think it's just oh, okay. all our, our internet's not, all the stars are not aligned today. But just the one question, Rosibel Guzman was asking if the dish was inspired by the cannoli. Okay. Um, give me a minute. I can't hear you.
Thank you everybody for everybody's patience. It's just technology, Mexico City. Okay. So I just restarted this. Let's see if that fixes things. Can you hear me there? I can hear you. It, oh, for, yeah. some reason, for some reason it was, it was like getting choppy. I couldn't hear you. Um, it froze, but I think we're in better shape. Okay, perfect. So I hope this solves it. Answering your question, I'm not 100% sure which one happened first, if the cannoli or the gaznate. Um, one thing that is sure is that both come from Europe. Um, this one came from Spain to the new Spain, um, but I'm not 100% sure which one was first of, of I like the that answer. I like that answer. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to cut pieces. In this case, my um, mold is almost five inches. I'm going to cut four inches pieces um, just to make sure everything is inside my um, mold and I don't have any um, anything over this edge. I'm first gonna cut right here. I'm using a pizza cutter. You can also use a chef's knife. This is just a little bit quicker. And just to make sure I start with a rectangular shape. Let's say I'm going to go from right here and then right here and of course these scraps can be reused so please do not discard them and i'm going to cut four inches here Let's go right here. And while I am doing this, I'm going to start preheating my oil. What kind of oil are you using today, Eliseo? Um, I usually use, when I'm deep frying anything, I use canola oil. Um, whenever I'm making churros or gaznates, I usually use canola oil. See, for me, it's usually the one that works best and it has a good flavor. It's good also to know that back in the day, these were not fried with oil, but with lard instead. Because of course that was the um, type of fat that was widely available. I know a lot of people now think of lard and are like, I'm not, I don't wanna even touch that with my hands and eat. But, They're probably more um, delicious. They're probably more delicious because of the tallow. Absolutely. Exactly. Do you know exactly. we can still, if we were to do a trip, um, to Mexico City, could we find them with lard, manteca? Or yes. do you think most most folks would be with um, with oil? Yes, I think with lard, most people usually make them still. And most people, let's say, if you go and have a, any type of meal in the markets here, they will very likely cook with lard. It's it's widely widely used, um, and I know it's not everyone's favorite, but I really like it. And even with, um, when I make bread, uh, sometimes I'm, I, I know most people prefer all butter. Sometimes for the dough of my bread, I use half butter, half lard, or all lard, just because of the flavor and the different texture that it gives to your um, baked goods. Okay. So I'm gonna start wrapping this around my, um, tubes, my molds. I'm gonna use just a little bit of egg as a glue. 
In this case, you want to be very careful that you just have egg on top of the dough and not on the mold. Because if you drop some egg on the mold, then the dough will stick to it. So you want to be very, very careful. And if you have some egg leaking, you can just clean it with a paper towel. Lady Sel, oh, Rosvelgus, I'm sorry. Um, Eliseo um, Rosvelle Guzman is asking for the scraps. Should we rest, um, put the rest in the fridge again before rolling them out? Uh, yeah, not necessarily in the fridge, but I just put them in a, um, I'm not using um, plastic wrap anymore, but I'm just covering it with, um, with this just to make sure it will not dry out. And then it's gonna rest for let's say 10 minutes and then you can roll it again. Mm -hmm. Out of this recipe, you're gonna get about a dozen, a dozen gasnates. By the way, gasnates is like a, I'm not sure you're familiar with that. I'm not sure how it is in Colombia, but in Mexico, gasnate is the neck of a duck. So it's no. like it's like that that long neck of a duck, um, uh -huh. Uh -huh. and you could you can also call that a person's neck, but it's a little rude to do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll have to ask my mom. That's good. To, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's good to know what um, to describe it all in language. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, in every place in the Americas. We use different words for different things. Okay. There we go. Okay. I have three ready for us now. What temperature ideally are we looking for for the oil for frying? Um, so if you do have a thermometer, that's going to be 350 Fahrenheit, give or take. If you don't have one, don't worry. I will show you in a moment how to know when your oil is um, ready. Um, one thing that is very important is that if your oil starts smoking, you have to stop right there because it's too hot, definitely. And this is valid for when you're making donuts, churros, anything that you're going to deep fry. Um, it's better to stop right there. Okay, right now I'm at 320. I'm gonna start putting this in there very soon. I'm going to bring a plate and a paper towel. Okay. I am almost at 340. Here we go. I'm at 340 now. It's gonna keep rising a little bit. So I'm gonna start putting this in there. I'm gonna put just two at a time. And because of that um, alcohol and that acidity there is in the white wine, they're gonna start popping right away. I have bubbles almost immediately. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do almost two minutes per side. I'm gonna set a timer even. And at two minutes, you should have a little bit of color. It should look like a nice light golden color. I'm gonna flip them and then I'm gonna do the other side. And so that's a good sign if at the two minute mark, you still don't have any color. You need to increase the heat a little bit. If it's too dark at uh, the two minute mark, then you need to lower it a little bit. Okay, and my oil temperature is right now at 350. That's perfect. And from there I can, um, if it's moving up or down, I can just adjust the heat. Is this a type of cookie after it's fried, like a donut to dip it in like sugar cinnamon or so people get an idea of like the texture of the outside is. So the real 
flavoring is going to come from the meringue or is there extra flavors outside of the, the tube? Yeah, this is, uh, so what the shell is going to give you is a lot of texture because it's going to be like super crunchy. I didn't add any extra um, sugar to the shell. You could with the meringue and that's, that's a lot of sugar already and I don't want it to be overly sweet. That's also the reason uh, they like to cut the sweetness with some um, lime juice or I'm using today raspberries to cut through that sweetness. Um, so it's not too, too sweet. Um, it's not like, let's say when you're making churros. That, uh, okay. So two minutes, one side, I have a nice color right there. I'm gonna do two minutes on the other side. And by the way, I have, let's say like half an inch, three quarters of an inch of oil in my cooking pot. This is a nice color. I don't want them to be uh, way darker than that. That's okay. That is not. My oil is getting a little too hot. I'm at 365 now. And I'm at the lowest heat. So I'm just taking this a little bit the heat so it's not too warm. And in a moment, we're gonna start making the filling. We're gonna make a meringue as the filling. Ideally, how's the best way to eat it? Like when it's still warm or you have to wait for the, the shell to cool down before you stuff? What's the best way? Oh, no, you can wait for it to cool down a little bit. That's, that's perfect, yes, because it's gonna take a few, a few, a good, let's say 10, 15 minutes to make your meringue. So that's gonna give your, your shell time to cool down. Um, so we're gonna start make, making our meringue in a moment. Um, it's good to know there are three different kinds of uh, meringue. Depend, and each one um, is called a different way depending on how you incorporate the sugar and the egg whites and if you cook them or not and how you cook them. So the first type is the um, French meringue. French meringue means you're gonna take raw egg whites and just um, room temperature sugar. You're gonna mix them and you're gonna um, whisk for a very long time until you get those nice stiff peaks. Um, it's the easiest to make, um, but it's not the most, it's the least stable of all of them. So this one is the one you would use if you were making, let's say like a pavlova and you're gonna bake your meringues because then they're gonna set and they will be good to go. I wouldn't do that if I was making, let's say a lemon meringue tart, because then it would start oozing, they would start separating after a couple hours and you don't want that to happen. Then the next one, which is the one that we are going to be making today is the, um, uh, let me just, okay, that's a nice color. I'm gonna take this up to heat. So the one that we're going to be making today is the Swiss meringue. For the Swiss meringue, we are going to take um, room temperature egg whites and you're gonna mix that with your sugar and then you're gonna put that um, in a bowl over a double boiler. So what that's gonna do is that if you're gonna um, just very gradually increase the temperature of your, um, of your two ingredients. Uh, this way you will not have scrambled eggs because remember if you cook eggs too quickly, you will have scrambled eggs. Uh, we don't want that in this case. So you want to um, get it to the right temperature gradually, kind of slowly while you are moving and whisking all the time. I've made lemon meringue pies. I guess there's an Italian meringue way where it's whipped and then you pour 
the hot sugar, it's been a while, you pour it in and and keep whipping it, whipping it. And that's the type you use for a lemon meringue. Exactly. Yes, that's the Italian one. And that's, I think, the most, it's the most stable, but it's also the, like the, a little bit more tricky. It feels like a science project a little bit. You have to get the syrup to the right temperature before pour, pouring it on top of the um, egg whites. Mm -hmm. Egg whites should have the right texture. So yeah, it does feel like a science project. You have to be ready for it. Um, but I quite like the process. I really enjoy the process of making meringue. It's just like, um, it, it's very cool just to see, turn this wrong to that little cloud and such a beautiful texture. And it's super so, stable. Yes, but it's super stable. Because one of us, the lemon meringue or a chocolate, you know, some people put meringue on chocolate, you know. Exactly. So the, um, yeah. This is the one you would use when you're not going to cook your meringue any further. So let's say as when you're making a lemon meringue tart or something like that, that's the best, best way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see the color of this. I'm just going to flip it and I'm going to start with the meringue in just a moment. Oh, there we go. I'm just going to cook the other side, there we go. Now, one thing that is very important whenever you're making meringue, any kind of meringue, is that you want your um, utensils and your ingredients to be 100% free of any trace of fat. So I take a little extra step whenever I am making a meringue. And this is that I'm, I just like super, super clean everything with just like a paper towel and soaker. Every tool that I'm gonna use, even the surface of the counter that I'm using, just to make sure um, I don't have any trace of fat. Make sure to avoid using uh, plastic bowls because plastic usually absorbs the fat. And even if you cannot look at it, it will might have, it might have absorbed some fat from anything that you made previously there. And then your marine will not go through stiff peaks. So I took that step Previously, I just like super, super cleaned all my um, utensils that I'm gonna use for the meringue. And that's um, whether you're making a French, Swiss or Italian meringue, it's better just to be safe. Uh, and, okay, so my last um, is almost ready. Let me see if I can. You have to be careful when you get rid of the tubes because you don't want to break this. And there we go. We have a very nice shell to fill with ring. Remember, be super, super careful because you don't want to. There we go. And I'm going to take the third one off the heat and that's it okay i'm setting this aside and i'm going to start my meringue for a moment as i said before it's super important that you get rid of any traces of fat you don't want to risk it so what ideal bowl would you use a glass or a stainless steel? Um, since I'm going to be using my stand mixer, I'm simply going to be using the stainless steel bowl of my mixer. You can, of course, use a um, hand mixer. In that case, you can use both glass or stainless steel. Whatever you have available is fine. There we go. Just as I said before, it's important to avoid um, plastic. Okay. Here we go. I have here a small pot with just a little bit of water for my double boiler. And I'm going to bring my ingredients 
for the um, meringue. I'm going to give you the list of ingredients for this Swiss meringue. This is five large egg whites at room temperature. Um, make sure you separate your egg whites and egg yolks very carefully, because remember, you don't want any, any trace of fat from the yolk, because then you wouldn't have stiff picks. Like you can whisk for an hour and you will not get there. So make sure you, you are really careful when you separate your egg whites and egg yolks. So again, that's five large egg whites. Then you're gonna use one cup or 200 grams of granulated sugar. Um, also a little bit of um, table salt, just a quarter of a teaspoon. Um, then uh, vanilla bean paste or vanilla extract. I usually use just like seven grams or two teaspoons. And you can use um, the zest from one lime orange or mandarin. Today I have orange. Uh, that's my, my favorite usually. Mandarin when it's available and it's in season, it's great as well. And again, totally optional and totally not traditional. I'm gonna be folding in some raspberries into this meringue. Um, you can do that, you can skip that. And you could also do, let's say sprinkles, chocolate chips, uh, or like dried nuts to finish your um, gas nuts, once they are filled, you know, just like put them in some, on top of some sprinkles or whatever, and they will stick to the sides of your gas nuts, and that will look really pretty as well. We'll give them some color. Okay. So, first thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to mix my egg whites. with my sugar. This is uh, refined granulated sugar. I am also going to be adding my salt. And I'm gonna start mixing just to incorporate everything. Again, remember I like super, super cleaned all my tools, all my utensils with um, paper towel and distilled white vinegar, just to make sure these will get to the right stage. And my water is right now barely starting to boil, so I'm gonna lower it I'm gonna take it to the lowest setting and I'm gonna put this on there. I'm gonna keep whisking at all times. Remember, you don't want to let this without whisking for a very long time. Cause then the egg whites that are touching the bottom of the bowl are gonna start cooking. And then you're gonna get again, scrambled egg whites and we don't want that. Okay. And in this case, since we're making a Swiss meringue, we're just gonna cook it until all the sugar has um, dissolved. Let me see if, there we go. Okay. So remember whisking at all times. It's gonna take a few minutes. Make sure you are whisking all the time. And again, I'm using my um, stand mixer today, but if you have a hand mixer, a hand electric mixer, that's fine. You can use that. Or if you want to do like a real workout, you can whisk by hand, but that's going to take a while. I'm using a very low heat right now. 
again, I don't want to do a high heat because if I do that, again, I might risk um, cooking the eggs too quickly and then having scrambled eggs. I know the scrambled eggs is a problem when you're working with eggs. Are there any, if by chance you get slightly little bit of scrambled eggs, is there a way to fix it? Or yeah, if it's, it's turns us, you know, there's any secrets of the trade. Oh, if, if it's just a little bit, you can of course just strain it and it will be fine. But again, make sure you're using a metal strainer and you're, it's like super clean because otherwise, again, you might be, um, Contaminating, contaminating it with some fat, and then it will not go to stiff peak. It's been there for like a minute now, I think, or so, and it's starting to feel a bit lighter as I am whisking. I can, I can feel, feel some of the sugar that is not dissolved. So I'm going to give it another minute or two minutes. It's also important not to whisk too quickly because if you whisk too quickly in this case, then it's going to take a very long time for this to come to the right temperature. Um, so two things are happening now. One, we are dissolving the sugar. This, the sugar is melting and it's being incorporated with the egg whites. And two, very important, our egg whites are being pasteurized. So now they will be um, safe to be eaten by everyone. Once all the sugar has dissolved, then you know the um, egg whites are at the right temperature and they have been pasteurized. And if you're not quite sure you're at the right temperature, you can take like super, super clean fingers. And again, just take a little bit of this mixture between your fingers and just like rub them between your fingers. And if it still feels like a little grainy from the sugar and not all of it has melted, then you need to do a little bit more time. Okay. I'm gonna give it just a few more seconds, but I feel that all my sugar has melted, most of it. There we go. I'm gonna take this off the heat now. And I'm gonna bring my mixer. And I'm going to be using a medium high speed. For this, if you have like a KitchenAid type of mixer, that's gonna be around speed six or seven. And of course, I'm going to be using the whisk attachment. So here I go. And see. I'm going to bring it closer. Bring it up thinner. And we're starting to see that change of texture. It's going to go to soft peak. 
and then it's going to go to skip pick. And when that happens, I'm going to be, well, first you can check if it's ready by doing, you know, like the flip test, like flip it on top of your head to see if it's ready. If it's nice and light, then it's not going to fall. Um, when you know it's ready, you can add any picture set. Um, I'm going to fold that by hand carefully later. You can use also your vanilla extract if you want to use it. And like today, I'm going to be adding some red hairs. This last step, I'm going to do it by hand. I'm sure if you can see how the texture really changed and it was just like one minute or so. I'm always really excited when this happens. I'm going to have close to me a piping bag for my meringue. So Elisa, when is the best time, once you um, stuff them with the meringue, how long can they stay out? If you're gonna say you're gonna have a party, is it best to fill them like a couple hours beforehand or fill them up like right before serving? Um, usually mm -hmm. with this type of meringue, it's better to fill them right before serving, mm -hmm. in my experience. The um, shells, on the other hand, can be made in advance, even a few hours or even like one day in advance, you keep them in a closed container. And then right before serving them, you can fill them. Okay, I can tell I have a very nice texture. Nice and fluffy and thick. I'm going to add now my vanilla extract. And just whisk for a few seconds to incorporate that. There we go. And now. I'm going to get rid of the mixture so I have more room to show you. By the way, it's very important. Like, can you see what I'm doing to get rid of the meringue? It's very important that you do it to the side so you don't break your um, whisk. And I'm talking from experience that has happened before. So be very careful, please. So let's get rid of the mixture. Here we go. So I'm going to be adding some orange zest now. And so we have another question by Rosiva Guzman. She's asking with the dough, can uh, you make a few at a time? How long will the dough keep and how should it be stored? Um, um, so if it can be a couple hours at room temperature, Make sure it's always um, in a closed container. And if you want to keep it in the fridge, I wouldn't put it there for more than one day. So one day and then you can use it. Okay. So I have orange zest now. I'm going to be adding some raspberries to this. I'm just using them whole and I'm going to just break them just a little bit as I am folding them into my meringue. There we go. And 
and you're gonna start seeing some of the beautiful juices from the raspberries. Okay, I think that's enough. I don't want to overwork my meringue. And I'm simply gonna put some in a piping bag. I'm using a large piping bag. I usually just use this tall container, any type of like tall jug or any like, a, even like a tall cup will work. This is just to make sure I have both hands free to transfer my meringue to the back. There we go. And with piping bags, always make sure to not overfill them. So about half of their capacity, that's more than enough. There we go. Usually when I use a piping bag, I put it in between these two fingers right here, and then twist a few times just to make sure it's not gonna come out towards this end. And then you can start piping. I'm gonna cut, um, make sure you have um, a good size so the raspberries can go out because some of them are hole to make sure it's not too small otherwise it might get a little club uh, let me bring a second clean plate for my final product there we go so i'm simply going to do some on this side you can of course use a piping bag you have um and not a piping bag, a piping tip. If you have that, like a star piping tip, if you want to have that this sign on the edge, otherwise you can have them just like this. I'm drilling already. Okay, there we go. Make sure you go really deep because you want that meringue um, all the way in your nuts. And voila, that's it. Rosibel Gosman says they look delicious and they do, especially the afternoon pickup with some coffee or a cup of tea, right? right? Right, <laughs> definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, let me get my compañero Averaldo on because you know we take those photos. Uh, they live oh, forever. Nice. Live forever mm -hmm. on our um, on our YouTube and hey, Facebook sir. channel. Hey, let me fix this first. Uh, <laughs> see what I'm doing. Remove the spotlight. Okay, there you go. All right. On three, uno, dos, y tres. Oh, gracias. <laughs> As, as always, it's always a pleasure. You bring your favorite cookies to us every single time that we meet. <laughs> um, please let people know if they're, um, they, I know you're still doing online classes. If they happen in Mexico City, how can we find you? Yes, thank you. Um, you can find me on Instagram. I'm on Instagram um, as Eliseo Lara with a C, Eliseo Lara. And you can also find me on uh, mexicanbaking.com. I host online classes and I just resumed my in-person classes in Mexico City. So if you have a trip coming, I'd love to bake with you. So since you're still doing um, online classes, which when is your next online class for those who are who wanted to join up and sign up for your classes? I'm going to be doing a churros class very soon. Um, and I think I'm going to offer some more cakes classes, even ice creams, because it's getting hot. 
like I know it's getting hot for you and also here. I think not as hot as some parts of the US, but for me it's quite hot. So yeah, more like very refreshing desserts. Bueno, we are still figuring out about program for the summer, but I'd love to have you back. But again, muchísimas gracias. I hope people reach out to you in person or your online classes as always a pleasure. Muchísimas gracias, Eliseo. Suerte and we'll be in touch soon. Gracias. Y se lo, con eso se lo paso. Sí, muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Jimena. A ti, a ti. Aquí te paso mi compañero, a Abraldo. Mm -hmm. Gracias, Eliseo. Yes, we'll have to, uh, next time we're in Mexico City, we will have to check out where the gasnates are so you could uh, point them out and so we could have some. They look really, really delicious. All right. So thank you all for joining us on En Casa con la Plaza this uh, afternoon here. Let me add a spotlight to myself here. And uh, what else? Okay. Thanks to our sponsors, Union Pacific Foundation, Institute of Museum and Library Services. If you didn't catch this entire episode, technological problems and all, we'll be posting it on our website uh, and on our Facebook page as well, and on our uh, YouTube channel as well. LAPCA.org is our website. At La Plaza LA is our YouTube and our Facebook channel. So thank you for joining. Uh, next up on Wednesday at seven o'clock, we're gonna be talking about web three. It's like uh, we had web internet. We started with internet learning to do all the the searches and all that stuff, then web two, now web three, which is NFTs, blockchain, DOAs, things I know nothing about, but we're gonna find out what they're about by two experts in the field uh, who are part of a, a Chicano community that are that's getting together to share their knowledge for, to artists, techno, technology people, and the rest of us who wanna know what all this is about and how we could get rich, or maybe not. Uh, so a... Let's see, that's it for today. Muchas gracias, Eliseo. Muchas gracias, Jimena. We'll see you all soon. Y gracias a todos out there for joining us on En Casa con la Plaza Cocina. All right, bye-bye. We'll see you next week. <laughs>